Hi, everybody. This is Sam Hyde with Circle. Um, we're just uh, just getting started here. Let's give everyone just maybe a minute or two more um, to trickle in here, and then uh, we'll make a start of it. So thank you all for joining, um, and we'll be ready to roll in, in just a minute. Looks like we've got a good bunch of people now. So why don't we go ahead and jump in and um, make a start of it here. So um, thanks for joining us. We'll do a round table tonight uh, with Surrogacy and IVF. Um, obviously, I'm here from, well, not obviously, but I'm here from Circle as well as Anthony Brown. Um, and then we have Dr. Brower as well from Shady Grove. Um, and uh, can we flip forward? Yeah, so here's a great picture of all of us. You can see us on the on the camera as well. But um, I'm the president um, and owner of uh, Circle Surrogacy. Um, I'm joined tonight by Dr. Brower, um, who we've worked with for many years um, and have done uh, quite a lot of journeys together, I think. Um, and Dr. Brower is at Shady Grove. And then we're also joined by um, Anthony Brown, who is a, uh, a lawyer on our team um, out of New York and uh, one of the most knowledgeable people about surrogacy um, out there as well as a parent through surrogacy, um, which is great. Mm -hmm. So um, a couple of housekeeping items before we get started here. So everybody on the on the webinar right now is in listen only mode. Um, we'll keep it that way just to kind of keep down on, on some of the ancillary noise. Um, we love questions on this, right? So we, we love to hear how you're thinking about things and, and where we can dive in. This is a complex process um, and one that uh, there's a lot of nuance to. And so no question is too silly. Um, no question is too embarrassing. Um, that we're just here to help you guys make an informed choice um, on your path to parenthood. So you'll have a question box on your right side there. Just fire them in um, as you think about them anytime through the through the webinar, um, and uh, and we will pick them all up um, and we will run through them um, after we go through a little bit of kind of um, foundational content. So let's flip forward one more. So we'll do just a quick intro on Circle. Um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Brower to do a quick intro on Shady Grove. We've just kind of teed up about 10 questions for an FAQ, um, just some of the questions that we think are important to cover off um, to give you a sense on, on how these journeys usually work. Um, and we'll run through those. And then we'll leave time for a Q&A session, which I think is really the, the, the meat of things at the end to make sure you guys have a chance to ask um, whatever questions are on your mind. Um, and hopefully we can get a good kind of back and forth going on some of the questions. So. Uh, let's go ahead and flip forward. So let me just give a quick intro on Circle. Um, Circle Surrogacy Day Donation, um, this is actually our 25th year um, uh, as an agency uh, in business. Um, and uh, this month is actually our 25th anniversary month. If you follow us on Instagram, you can see all these great pictures we're doing. But um, we've got a great team of people. Um, you know, we've had over 2,200 babies born through our program. Um, we've got about 70 employees. Many of us have been through um, some sort of infertility journey in our lives, whether we're parents through adoption or through surrogacy or through IVF, um, or we've been a surrogate or been an egg donor. Um, so I think we have a pretty unmatched depth of professional experience in this, but we also have a ton of personal experience, um, which is great. And we are a full service agency. So we have everything in house. Um, if you have us, plus you have a great IVF clinic like Shady Grove, you don't need any third parties at all to handle um, your journey. We will help you manage all aspects of it, um, from legal to social work to case managers to accountants, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we love uh, we love helping people with every aspect um, of the journey. And one thing we're really proud of, of ourselves, uh, one thing we're really proud about our journeys is um, we really believe in strong relationships between our parents and our surrogates and our, our egg donors. Um, great relationships lead to great outcomes. Um, and that is really a, a foundational element of our program. Uh, the second one there I think is equally as important, which is, you know, I think we have, uh, maybe this is a little bit of hubris, but I think we have the best screening process um, uh, out there for, for surrogates and donors. We're only accepting between a percent uh, and two percent of the applicants um, who start the process with us to, to become a surrogate. And so um, we have really, really good carriers um, that we're, we're really proud of and a lot of return carriers as well. So um, Dr. Brower, will you tell us a bit about uh, Shady Grove? Sure. Hi, my name is Anat Brower. I'm one of the physicians at Shady Grove Fertility New York, which is the latest region of Shady Grove Fertility. 
Um, so Shady Grove Fertility has been around since the early 90s. Uh, we're almost 30 years old now, starting mostly in the DMV region and eventually growing to Florida, Georgia, Pennsylvania, um, and Santiago, Chile, now in New York, also coming to Colorado very soon. Um, we uh, have, you know, our big tagline is over 85,000 babies born, um, many through surrogacy. Um, on a personal note, I um, have worked, you know, with Circle previously. I worked with a lot of agencies, um, but in my former practice, which was based in Connecticut, I had a chance to do a lot of work with surrogacy. And one of the most important things you want to find that makes it easier for the patient and easier for the physician is a really good agency that will find you a really good, reliable carrier. Um, and I've certainly found that in Circle, and my patients have as well. Um, and this is not a paid advertisement. This is just the honest truth. <laughs> um, so I really appreciate being here and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Dr. Brower, that's fantastic. Um, so we, as I said, we just put together a list of some initial FAQs for us to run through. Um, these kind of cover off some of the foundational elements um, of a journey. Um, and Dr. Brower, why don't you take this first one, which I think is a really common question from parents around, you know, yeah. is it better to create an embryo first or to find a surrogate first or run those in concurrently, you know, love your thoughts. So this is a very common question that I get from intended parents. And just to um, have some definitions, an intended parent um, is, is the, are, the, are the two individuals who are, or one individual who's donating the gametes and the gestational carrier is the, the woman who will carry, um, carry the pregnancy. And so when I meet with intended parents, they're coming to me at different places in their journey. Some come to me and they already have embryos created. Some come to me and they already have a surrogate, but they have to create embryos. And some come to me and they haven't done anything and they just kind of want to know what path to take. I think a very important part of this is just you know, having all of the, at least if you haven't created embryos, at least having the initial workup done of, you know, why it is that you need a surrogate, um, what your ovarian reserve is, or, you know, to make a baby, you need several things, right? You need sperm, you need a uterus, and you need a good quantity of eggs and good quality eggs. And so one of the, um, you know, the first steps to all of this is just having that workup and making sure that you have good quality sperm, whether it's from a male partner or it's from a donor sperm, um, making sure you have an appropriate egg reserve or if you're using a donor, um, working on starting to identify the donor. I will say that I look at this almost as two separate journeys of creating the embryos and then finding a carrier. And sometimes they can be done concomitantly. But the reason that I personally like to work on creating the embryos first is because, first of all, finding a carrier can take a little bit of time. Um, and what you don't want to have happen is that you don't want to find a carrier and secure somebody and then not have an embryo to be able to transfer into her. So I, I also think, and Sam will talk more about this, but I could imagine that from the carrier's perspective, it is reassuring to know that an intended parent already has embryos that are in the freezer that are that are ready to go, which brings me to another point, right? There's really two ways to do IVF. Um, there's traditional IVF, whereby you retrieve eggs, you fertilize them with sperm, you grow them out to a blastocyst, and then put them back into the uterus. And then there's IVF with pre-implantation genetic testing, PGT, which means you retrieve eggs, you fertilize them with sperm, you grow them out to a blastocyst, and a blastocyst is an embryo that has two cell layers has an inner cell layer that becomes a fetus and an outer cell layer that becomes a placenta, you can actually test some of the placental cells to see what the genetics of that embryo is. When I say genetics, I mean, how many chromosomes does it have? Is it likely to be, to how likely is it to make a baby, right? If you have a chromosomally normal embryo, it has about a 60 to 65% chance of making a baby versus if it's not tested, it depends on your age group, right? So someone who's 40, may, that embryo, if it's not tested, may have only a 10% chance of, of that making a baby. So while I don't believe in a 100% PGT on everybody, I do find that in my surrogacy journeys, it is very helpful to have a chromosomally normal embryo that you're putting back into the uterus because it takes out a variable. Because when a, it, when a transfer fails, the question always becomes, was it the embryo or is it the environment? And you want to control both as much as you can. So you don't want to keep transferring embryos that are failing in a surrogate and thinking, I have to switch the surrogate when really the embryos weren't totally controlled for. So I do think it's, you know, in my opinion, it's good to kind of work on the embryo journey first 
you can start looking at the surrogacy journey at the same time, but really try to secure those embryos before you, you know, secure the carrier. Sam, I don't know what you think about that. But. Yeah, I, I would, I would agree. I think that the one nuance to this that is, is worth mentioning is, you know, most of the established, you know, highly professionalized agencies out there do have a wait list um, as it relates to finding a carrier. And so, what we often see is, you know, parents will sign on with us to find a surrogate, then they'll go create those embryos. And we won't actually match them with a carrier until they have the embryos created, because the situation you describe is is one that is 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 a real risk. You don't want to match a parent and a surrogate um, without embryos having already been created. And when sometimes we see surrogates who say they won't match with anybody unless they have embryos created, um, but there is an opportunity to kind of, as you just mentioned, Dr. Barr, run those processes concurrently because you know we do have a wait list for parents. Um, our wait list for surrogates, first people will sign on, you know, wait five months. Um, or so before we have a carrier available for them. So, um, great. Well, I think the next question, actually, Dr. Brower, is great for you as well. Um, so, how involved will a doctor be in helping to choose a surrogate? Sure. So, the way it usually works in our practice um, is that you know the first step. You know, obviously, Sam will go over how you narrow down a list of carriers for the intended parent. But once you find someone you really think like is going to be a good match, one of the first steps is sending your physician the medical records on that carrier. So the nice thing about Circle is that they already have kind of, with every clinic they work with, they kind of have a list of, you know, no-goes for that clinic. Like, is there a BMI cutoff? What specifically in their medical history? How many C-sections? How many vaginal deliveries? All these things. So they're not gonna send me carriers that they know I'm not gonna accept because it's a waste of everybody's time, right? So the first step is to send the medical records, all of the delivery records, you know, OB clearances, prenatal labs, everything like that. And once I preliminarily, um, or your physician preliminarily clears that carrier, we do bring them for in-person screening and testing. Um, and during that time, your doctor will have an opportunity to meet with them um, in person. Of course, this has changed a little bit with COVID and I can I can talk about that, but we've been able to kind of get around things. Um, but you, you do have a one-on-one -on -one consultation. Um, they also have a full physical exam. Um, inclusive of um, what we call a mock transfer or a trial transfer, where we actually do a trial transfer with a trial catheter to make sure it's like a really easy pass so that when it comes time for the embryo transfer, we don't have surprises. And also a saline sonogram, which is basically an ultrasound where you infuse saline into the cavity and you take 3D pictures of the uterine cavity to make sure it's a perfect home for your embryo. Um, and urine toxicology screening, infectious disease testing, um, Sam can talk a little bit more about the psychological testing. I know Circle does their own, and we also we also have some in addition to that. So that medical screening is really important, and it gives me a chance to actually meet with the carer one on one, get to know them a little bit, get to know why they're doing this, um, and just you know make sure that they're not only medically sound, but you know we we do have kind of a banter back and forth of of is this a good fit? Because at the end of the day, like a doctor knows their patients and they know if something's gonna you know, work out or not. So I think it's a really good opportunity on both fronts. Um, so we do get pretty involved, um, but, but you know, after some checks have been in place by the agency, of course. Yeah, great, great point. And then I think what Dr. Bauer is, is hitting on is exactly right. It's, Circle will do, um, you know, a, a lot of screening up front, um, including a psych screening, you know, social work evaluation for the surrogate and, um, you know, her partner. Uh, you know, we'll review the medical records and we'll send them to Dr. Brower to review. And we'll also go through criminal and financial background checks and a bunch of questionnaires. So um, by the time, you know, we will, the doctor's time is obviously um, best spent directly with patients. And so we want to make sure we're only showing Dr. Brower surrogates that we already feel really good about. Um, and so we'll do a lot of that upfront work, you know, let Dr. Brower make one of the final evaluations um, as part of it. Um, and then we'll work together to get, to get everyone to uh, transfer. Um, and it's very rare, I will say, if you have a good agency doing all this pre-screening the way it should be done, it's very rare that by the time you get to that in-person screening and testing, we pick up a red flag. I mean, it ha if you have a good agency, it's, it's very rare that that should happen. That's right. Not impossible, but rare. Not impossible, yes, of course. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that's exactly right. So how does the matching process between surrogates and parents work? And this is... This is something, you know, if we were to sit down to, for a private consultation, you know, Anthony and I could go into uh, a lot of detail about exactly kind of the nuance of this. Um, but what Circle does 
um, and what I think you know most of the the professionalized agencies out there do is we do what was pretty much one to one matching. So you know we'll have you know our surrogates coming in um, each month on one side, and a lot of our parents coming in um, on the other side, and we'll look through the surrogates we have that have passed screening. Um, all the way through, and we'll say, we think this particular surrogate might be a good fit for this particular family, um, and we'll pass that profile over to you um, for your review. If you like the surrogate, you like the, the potential of it, we would then set you guys up for a phone call or, or a FaceTime call um, to make a determination whether we think there's a, the match there. Um, and then once there's a match, we'd help you through all the steps um, to, to get to a transfer. It's a little different than you know, some of the smaller agencies have kind of a Facebook of sorts of potential surrogates that are available. Most of the time, those surrogates haven't gone through any real screening. Um, and you know, then they're going to do the screening after you match with them, which is not probably the best way to do things. So um, I could get into that in a private consultation, but that's kind of the general, the general piece of it. Um, Dr. Bauer, do you want to take the next one on, on medical screening for, for surrogate? Sure. Yeah, it's similar to what I previously described. And so you know, the AS, ASRM, while the FDA doesn't deem, you know, we test for certain things, we do follow ASRM guidelines and you want to go with a clinic uh, that's going to follow ASRM guidelines. So we do do all, even though it's not required of us, we do do all the FDA testing on the surrogate as well, just as we would um, on the intended parents. Um, and so all the infectious disease testing, urine toxicology screening, full physical exam, um, FDA questionnaires, um, saline sonogram, mock embryo transfer. And that's, that's again, that's done, you know, on the day of in-person screening and testing. Of course, if there's anything concerning, um, we go back to that person's OBGYN. If it's something fixable or solvable, like a borderline, you know, TSH, like thyroid that we, that we check that sometimes people can have borderline elevated levels. We always talk to the intended parents. We, we talk to them about, you know, risks and benefits. If it's something that's very easily fixable, you know, then we we have we help hook them up with medical care. If it's something that we say, you know, you really could find someone better. I mean, we're very honest about it. We don't we don't sugarcoat it. But that brings me back to what Sam said before. <clears throat> the problem with with some agencies that that match you and have you like have extensive interaction before that final medical screening is that you become emotionally attached to this carrier. And that becomes a real problem for the, the intended parent and the physician when you find something that's a real medical issue and that doesn't make them a great candidate to carry, but you're already emotionally attached and it's hard to get past it. So you find yourself almost making excuses for like why you wanna continue. And that's never a good path to go down, which is why I really like an agency that, you know, before you really get connected with that carrier, pass the medical screening, it's really important. Great. Um, I'll do the next one, and then I think, um, Anthony, I'd love for you to weigh in on some of the ones here on, on the underrun price insurance. So why is there a wait for a surrogate? This is a question we get uh, very frequently. Um, you know, if you were to join Circle, you know, you'd be looking at something in the order of a five to six month wait for a carrier. Um, and that's really driven by two things. First is, um, we have great programs that parents want to be a part of. Um, I think we have a pretty unique program in the space around um, our fixed cost uh, approach to things um, that really is, is you know, a much different approach than, than a lot of agencies. So we have a lot of parents that want to be a part of our program. Uh, the second piece is, you know, it is difficult to find suitable surrogates um, in a journey. Um, on an average month, we'll have somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500 women start the application process with us. Um, and we'll end up with between 25 and 35 women that we feel great about. Um, and that's still a lot of surrogates. I think we find more carriers, more suitable carriers um, per month than any, any agency in the country. Um, but you know, I, I won't compromise on our standards um, from a quality perspective just to shorten the wait time for parents. Um, you, know, you can imagine you know, if we accepted 10% of our surrogates or 8% of our surrogates, um, you know, I can have a surrogate for everybody on this call by the, by the end of this call. Um, but it, it's, it's not worth it for us as an agency. It's not worth it for you guys as parents uh, or potential parents. It's not worth Dr. Brower's time to, to work with surrogates that aren't going to have success. Um, and so we hold, those, we hold those screening criteria really, really, um, really tight. Um, and a world in which, you know, COVID has, you know, changed 
kind of the demographic trends of people that are available and interested in being this and have a, have a stable enough life to be a surrogate. Um, we've seen our match time tick up a little bit. Um, we're okay with that. Um, again, because we, we won't compromise on kind of the standards that we have from, from a screening perspective. So, um, Anthony, maybe you can talk about the next question on price um, and Dr. Bauer may weigh in a little bit on price as well. Next, I wanna be sensitive to make sure we have enough time for questions as well, which I already see coming in. So we kind of move through these last few FAQs a little bit. Absolutely. Um, I think the first, uh, the first issue to address when you're talking about uh, what is covered in price is to distinguish who are you paying? Are you paying the agency or are you paying the clinic? Because I think that there are certain costs that I've, I've had some people come in for consultations and they think we are uh, you know, an, a, a one-stop shop and they expect that the cost that they pay to us will cover the costs that go to the clinic. So it's important to distinguish between um, you know, where the money is going. The second aspect I think you need to ask is whether you're working in a fixed cost program or a variable cost program. Because in a variable cost program, there are going to be several categories of uh, costs that are going to be ranges, they're going to be estimates. And you're not gonna necessarily know specifically what those costs might be. So at Circle, we offer only a fixed cost program uh, for a number of reasons, but one is to really be transparent and to give our intended parents a sense of uh, of confidence in what they actually will be paying for the journey. Uh, that kind of cost insecurity is was feedback that we had received uh, from several intended parents that really pushed us towards creating an all fixed fee program. But to answer the question specifically from our point of view, from uh, Circle's point of view, there may be a situation that is not covered under the fixed cost program if, for instance, your carrier is a neonate, neonatal intensive care unit nurse. She's been a surrogate before, and she lives in an area where surrogates are in incredible demand. In those situations, there may be an augmentation to her base compensation that she asks for, or there may be an augmentation to her base compensation because she is experienced or because of where she lives. Um, from Circle's perspective, you as the intended parents will be given her profile, and in that profile, you'll be able to see where, uh, if any of these particular um, potential augmentations may exist. And if they are not uh, uh, something that you want to address, if you, you know, uh, understand that you've been told that there may be an estimated increase in this section or that section, but you've budgeted specifically for what the fixed fee program says, then you can certainly ask us for a rematch, which we absolutely will do. But usually the hidden costs uh, in our program, the only hidden costs come around base compensation. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about how insurance works in the, oh, actually before I do that, Dr. Brower, would you like to talk about um, the hidden costs per perhaps sure. in the- I was just resolving a crisis. In another part of my home. <laughs> okay. Um, sure. So the nice thing about um, so I love the fixed cost program at Circle because it very much mirrors um, one of Shady Grove's fixed cost programs, which is called the Shared Risk Program. Um, and so a lot of people nowadays have insurance coverage. I'd say about 70% of my patients have coverage for creating embryos, um, depending on the diagnosis. But for my patients who don't have coverage, who are self-pay we do have a, a few creative programs. So we have um, a sh something called Shared Help, which is our discount program, which about 87% of patients who apply for qualify for some percent discount off of their um, care, and that, that goes by your W-2s. Um, and then we also have something called Shared Risk, which is basically, I can't, Stand using the word, but it's kind of our guarantee program, which um, if you, whether if you're using a donor um, or if you qualify for it with your own eggs, which is really not that hard to qualify. We just have to know that we can retrieve eight mature eggs on you, which is actually like pretty liberal. Um, then it's basically a program whereby you're guaranteed to take a baby home or where you get your money back. Um, and so it's it's kind of one of these like fixed price programs, which you know I think you 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 pay a little bit more upfront, but especially for donor ag, I just think it's it's an excellent program, and you can use it with a GC rider. So you you use that program, then you just add on 
you know, a rider for using a carrier, which isn't that much more money. It's just, you know, a few thousand dollars, like $3,000 or something for an administrative fee um, to add a GC onto that. And so, and for the donor um, share risk, for example, you're guaranteed for up to six donors, meaning, you know, you go through a whole donor and you blow through all those embryos and there's nothing or a second one, you know, up to six. So of course, at every time point we have discussions, right? It's called shared risk because, you know, you're paying a little bit more to, you know, we're both hedging our bets. I'm, I'm trying to guarantee you a pregnancy. So, you know, every time you cycle, we obviously, as any physician would have a conversation about why it's working or not working. Um, but with, you know, with a carrier and a chromosomally normal embryo, I mean, that's pretty much the best success rate that, that you can get. So it's really nice to kind of have a guarantee um, behind that. Yeah, so uh, let me move on to how does insurance work for a journey? Uh, and you wanna make a distinction between the insurance for the child once the child is born and then the insurance for the gestational carrier. It's, it's simple, once the child is born, they go on your insurance. So if you are uh, doing surrogacy where your carrier is in another state or, or is outside of your network. Certainly you wanna make sure that your insurance will cover out of network costs and that will cover the costs of the child. For the, um, for the carrier uh, at Circle, we actually have an amazing insurance package that covers the carrier. In many cases, we are able to use the carrier's own insurance, which I'm getting a little bit into the next question. Uh, and in some cases it is uh, less expensive. If you're working with a variable cost program, it may not be less expensive because you never know what the lifespan of your pregnancy is going to be. It could go over two years in the um, carrier's insurance. So you may be paying high deductibles twice during that um, uh, it, during the lifespan of the pregnancy. Um, but with the package that uh, Circle offers, we also have an underlying um, backup policy in place. So even if we start using the carrier's policy and she loses insurance uh, for some reason during the, um, during the pregnancy, we have another policy that comes in and covers uh, exactly the um, surrogate pregnancy. It's designed for surrogate pregnancies. We also have a complications policy that's part of our package. Uh, and we also have a life insurance policy that's part of our package in case God forbid something were to happen that would pay to the uh, carrier's family. Um, so essentially, in our program, it's covered under the fixed fee, no matter whether the carrier uses her own insurance or whether we provide the Lloyds of London insurance for her. And we are able to uh, have the you know, life insurance policy and the complications policy there. So it, it, really, if it is, uh, is it cheaper? It, it, it can be cheaper, like I said. Uh, and it's also wonderful for the carrier because the carrier gets an increase in her base compensation if we, uses her own, if we use her own insurance. Uh, and that is covered in the cost of the fixed fee program. But like I said, you don't necessarily know um, if, uh, you know, how long the pregnancy is going to be. And also, you don't know whether there's going to be any denial of insurance claims. And this leads into uh, the next question as well. We have a full team at Circle that really their job is to respond to denial of insurance claims. And we've been incredibly successful at um, having the insurance companies pay those claims. But if you're working with um, uh, independently or if you're working with a, a different agency who perhaps uses a third party attorney, then you may not have that kind of cost security around using your carrier's own insurance. Uh, and finally, what are the uh, advantages and disadvantages of having a lawyer at the agency? I can speak from my own personal experience being a parent through Circles program that having a one stop shop basically being if i have a legal question i have an attorney assigned to my case if i have uh, an accounting question i have an accountant assigned to my case but it really does provide having this big legal department provides a consistency to the process and it provides an access to the process if you're using a third party attorney for uh you know for the gestational carrier agreement say and you have a specific question about it you don't know how many clients she or he has you don't know whether they're gonna get back to you at a certain period of time. Circle is amazing at, at responding to client questions. And when you have an attorney it's assigned to you, it's, uh, it's very helpful uh, and it expedites things. But also I think um, it, it really creates uh, a quality control around the entire process. When everything is in house, there you can demand higher standards, which Circle does. Uh, 
Great. Are there any other? Yeah, let's Are... let's let's jump into some of the questions. So we got we've got quite a few coming through already, um, and so we can uh, we can just start ticking through these. Um, so I'll take the first one. Uh, does Circle have a package for IPs um, who have an existing potential gestational carrier? Um, yes, uh, we do. Um, we kind of tailor it to to what you need, um, and we'd love to chat with you about it specifically. Um, each situation in those regards is usually unique in terms of what parents exactly want, um, but that'd be something we could definitely get into um, in a uh, in, in a private consultation. So the answer is yes. Um, average cost um, in totality um, to do a surrogacy journey. So um, I'll kind of talk in broad strokes here, um, but generally speaking, you know, for an agency plus the surrogate, um, plus uh, all the ancillary costs around travel, insurance, um, contingencies, um, plus um, IVF. You're probably looking at about 135,000 for everything but the IVF, um, and then IVF. Dr. Brower, correct me if I'm wrong, but probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 45,000, depending on kind of what package. A little is less, you know, less than that. I mean, it depends if you're using donor eggs or not, <clears throat> but. Yeah, like for a donor egg, one to two split, for example, it's twenty four thousand for a shared risk, and if it's if you're one to one, it's thirty six. You know, so it just depends on somewhere around that. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. So, you know, surrogacy on our side, um, one thirty five five. You know, plus what Dr. Brower said, depending on if you're IVF, if you need donor egg or not. If you need donor egg through us, um, add twenty four thousand to to our one thirty five to get our, our donor aid program um, as well. So there's, again, this is another one, there's a little bit of nuance in, in kind of addressing your particular situation. Um, as Anthony said, all of our programs are fixed cost programs um, where we serve you on an unlimited basis until you own the child. Um, but there's some nuance within that that we'd be happy to talk about in a private consult. So. Uh, can the intended parents be on the birth certificate? I'll give that one, Anthony. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, uh, one of the, I think, most uh, hair pulling experiences is the legal certainty of your family through the process. And the good news is that in the majority of states, uh, there is something called a pre-birth order, which is a petition that's filed usually during the second trimester pregnancy. And the order is issued before the child is born. And it says that immediately upon the child's birth, the rights of the surrogate and her spouse, if she's married, are terminated, and that the rights of the intended parents um, are, are established and immediately they would go on the birth certificate. So the second the child is born, the parents are the legal parents. In some states, there's something called a post-birth order mechanism, and in those states, the um, petition is filed on an emergency basis immediately after the child is born, and it takes you know, four to five days to get the order, and then the birth certificate from the hospital is corrected to add um, the uh, non-genetically related parent. So from a legal standing, in most cases, uh, the parents are legal parents the second the child is born. And if not, it's two or three, four or five days later. Thanks, Anthony. Um, next question, Dr. Brower, this is probably best uh, for you. Um, this person says, I'm married to a woman. We plan to use her egg, ultimately create an embryo, which I will then carry. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and, and how you think about that uh, that scenario versus a kind of a, a surrogacy journey? Um, the, the person that asked, you know, would I be considered a surrogate? But I think right. yes, probably, but I, I would love your yeah, thoughts on we, we can, that. You know, we call that reciprocal IVF or co-IVF. It's something that we do a lot. Um, and there's usually the, the only time that I do recommend, and, and again, I love uh, Anthony, your, your legal opinion of this, is unfortunately the laws in New York are still not so friendly to same to same sex couples, like even though like marriage is legal and you're married. And so definitely if you're not married, I would recommend getting some kind of um, legal involvement. Um, Anthony, I don't know what your thoughts are on um you know if if they are married if you still recommend some kind of legal involvement yeah i absolutely do and one of the biggest um issues actually is at the clinic because the laws will look at the forms that you sign at the clinic to determine if there's a a, a conflict later on that's what your intention was 
So uh, I work with several clinics to make sure that the forms that they sign will accommodate situations like yours. Um, that is the first step. Uh, if you are, for instance, going to use uh, a known donor, then you should also have a known donor agreement in place as well. Uh, uh, currently, the law, the law is in New York until February 15th, 2021. The law in New York really um, only provides you with the possibility of doing a second or step parent adoption to uh, seal the rights of the non-birth parent in your situation. However, after that, when the Child Parent Security Act takes effect, you will be able to um, petition the court in a pre-birth order, and you will be able to get that same kind of pre-birth order in New York that you would be able to get in other states if you were using a surrogate. So you'll have your parental rights essentially established before the child is even born, which is great. So I know I, I, I spanned across your pregnancy with that answer, but uh, I, I think it's important to look at both sides of it when you're entering the situation and then when you're establishing parental rights. Absolutely. Medically, it's very similar. Create embryos, put them into a uterus. So we do a lot of the same testing, infectious disease testing, saline sonogram, mock embryo transfer. It's all very similar. But I agree with getting you know, legal counsel regardless, unfortunately. In those scenarios, you know, using an agency like Circle is, is probably superfluous. You're, you're best served with a lawyer. Um, we can, of course, recommend one if you want to reach out to us um, based on what state you're in, um, a great reproductive lawyer. Uh, but really, that's the IVF clinic with, with reciprocal IVF is, is probably your main player in that one. So um, another question about could we use my sister as a surrogate? I think we've already answered that. Yes, absolutely. Again, we'd want to address that kind of the nuance of that situation in a private consult with you. Um, is there an age limit age limit to receive a donor egg? Um, are there any restrictions? Um, I think this is for you, Dr. Brower. So an age limit for, for a potential woman to receive a donor egg. And then secondarily, um, any restrictions? Um, this person describes a specific disease, lupus, but they're in remission. Um, any restrictions on how that would work uh, with donor egg? So for, and I'm assuming you mean autologous, so put it back into you. I mean, autologous uterus, not, not egg. Um, so every clinic has different cutoffs. So ASRM actually, ASRM's cutoff uh, is 55. Our cutoff at Shady Grove is 50 um, for transferring an embryo back into you using your uterus. If it's after your 50th birthday, so let's say 51, we do recommend using a surrogate um, because as we know, pregnancy becomes more risky after 40, even more so after 45, even more so after 50. So our goal is, you know, a healthy baby, we would recommend after 50 that you that you do use a surrogate. With the question of lupus, so a lot of autoimmune disorders are a little bit um, unpredictable in pregnancy. So usually we use like a third, a third, a third, a third stay the same. I mean, I mean, as far as like flares and severity of disease, a third get better and a third get worse. Um, I do recommend that you work with your rheumatologist and have a preconceptual counseling with an MFM. An MFM is a maternal fetal medicine doctor. It's a high-risk obstetrician that deals with lupus all the time in pregnancy. And so I definitely recommend having a preconceptual consult and just optimizing yourself for pregnancy. Um, and, and they'll tell you whether, you know, what they think the risks are there. But I have plenty of women with lupus who carry their own and do well. Great, thank you. Um, next one is, what is the cost uh, for an egg donor using my husband's sperm and then using a surrogate? Um, so for that, if you were gonna use an egg donor through Circle, um, plus uh, your husband's biology and then have a surrogate through us as well, um, the, the cost on the surrogacy side and the agency side would be uh, 159.5. Um, that's unlimited until you go home with a child, um, plus any of the fees that you'd have at the IVF clinic, which I think Dr. Brower talked about um, a little bit before. Um, again, happy to sit down in a private consult and kind of run through the numbers with, with you on that. I'm sure that um, Dr. Brower would love to do that as well. Sure. Um, how long does the PGT process take, Dr. Brower, from egg retrieval um, to the eventual kind of transfer into, into a surrogate um, or, or whoever? So um, egg retrieval is considered day zero. And then we, we watch the embryos for seven days. So you'll get a call on day seven. So an embryo will usually make a blast on day five, six, or seven. You'll get a call on day seven, which when how many made it to blast. And we don't just we don't just send any blast for testing. It has to be a good quality blast. Um, so you'll get a, we call it a cryo call with how many were frozen were able to be tested. 
And basically we take some of the outer layer, we freeze the embryos, we send the cells off for testing, we get a report back around two weeks later with each embryo and its chromosomal complement. And now, depending on where your carrier is in her journey, like let's say she's already kind of prime, she's on birth control pills, you can just overlap her with a medication called Lupron and kind of get her started on, on her estrogen, which is what thickens the lining in the first half of the cycle, um, which usually they're on that for about two weeks. And then we do the transfer, we thaw the embryo, do the transfer on the sixth day of progesterone. So the PGT part takes seven days of growing an embryo, five to seven days of growing an embryo, two weeks to get those results back. Now your embryos are ready and waiting in the freezer. So a lot of the, the timeline really is depending on where the GC is and everything. Perfect. Um, next one, uh, very simple one, I'll just take this. Can you use Circles Insurance only? Um, if you're using your own surrogate, can we enroll at any time? Um, so the insurance um, umbrella that we put in place for our journeys is really specific to Circles journey. So if you're doing a journey independent or with another agency, um, we wouldn't be able to help you with, with the insurance element of it. Um, for our clients, we have this umbrella um, uh, approach that uh, Anthony talked about, and um, we, we have it for our clients. Uh, this is a great question for, for both of us. Anthony, I'd love for you to weigh in on it, and then I'd love to have Dr. Brower you to weigh in as well. Um, we're interested in having twins, um, each using uh, our own sperm, so this would be a two, two dad couple. Um, how does this affect the cost and process, and what are your opinions regarding twins at some clinics? Um, maybe don't recommend it. I mean, how do you guys think about that? Maybe, Anthony, you can take it first, and then Dr. Brower um, can talk about the clinic side. Yeah, when um, when uh, intended parents come in and, and think about um, just the costs of the surrogacy, surrogacy journey, I think twins seems to be um, a good idea to have your family kind of one and done and 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 uh, and taken care of. And we will certainly support your journey if you choose to um, uh, if you choose to do a multiple embryo transfer. Uh, there are uh, there is a cost augmentation, a twenty five thousand dollar cost augmentation. Uh, if you do choose to have uh, multiple embryo transfers. But I also al always want to caution people that, and I'm sure, Dr. Brower, you're going to go into this a little bit more, that there is a, a much higher chance that something could go wrong. And not only from the medical side, which Dr. Brower can speak to, but also uh, you may be forced to go to another state and stay there for two or three months if your child is in a neonatal intensive care unit. And that kind of life disruption, I think, you know, I, I don't think people necessarily consider that in the process as well. Um, from, the, from the medical side, uh, Dr. Brower will speak to you, but also just from the journey side and from the surrogate side, a, a surrogate pregnancy is, is it's harder if, it's a, if you're carrying twins. Uh, so Dr. Brower, I, I know you can fill in the blanks here better than I can. So from a medical perspective, I really do believe, and most physicians in our field now believe, that an elective single embryo transfer is the way to go. And that's because, you know, when twins turn out great, they're great. But you're not seeing the twins that, you know, have long-term disabilities from preterm deliveries or in the NICU for weeks on end. Um, we know that there's a much increased risk for not only the mom or the surrogate of preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, um, you know, C-section rates, et cetera, but also for the babies, there's definitely an increased risk of preterm delivery, which comes with significant long-term sequela for the brain, for the eyes, for the GI tract. And even if you control for gestational age, twins have a 12-fold higher rate of cerebral palsy, even if you control for gestational age. So I think given all of that, to me, the worst possible outcome worse than like a negative pregnancy test is, uh, you know, a 23 week twin delivery with long-term, um, you know, sequelae. And, and I think that's really what we're trying to avoid. Um, and, you know, and we're not even, you can, you can, you can do, you can stagger journeys, you can do them very close together. Um, but we really recommend putting back one embryo at a time. Our goal is, is one healthy baby at a time. And one other issue that, uh, that, that I should mention with that as well, from a matching perspective, is that it may take a little bit longer to find a carrier who uh, will will carry twins. So, so your your the timeline of your journey may be a little bit longer as well. 
Right, and then sometimes you have the scenario where people wait for twins and then they still only get pregnant with a singleton. So um, when my wife and I first did IVF uh, six and a half or seven years ago now, uh, we put in two and got one. So that happens uh, yeah, very, very, very frequently. And then you've waited a little bit longer, obviously. So um, we are, uh, this couple says, uh, we're, uh, in, we're in New York. Our surrogate is in Pennsylvania. Um, our pre-birth orders allowed there. Anthony, do you know the answer off the top of your head? Yes, Pennsylvania is a very interesting state. Um, Pennsylvania is, is is kind of a jurisdictional puzzle. Uh, in there are um, counties, and there are certain judges in those counties that the attorneys who are versed in assisted reproduction know that those are the judges that you put your uh, pre-birth order petitions before. Uh, so the the first question is a, is going to be a jurisdictional question. Uh, the attorney is going to need to, to find the right jurisdiction in which to file that petition. But then once the once you find that petition, then yes, pre-birth orders are are um, are doable in in Pennsylvania. Great. That that's one where I think Anthony, correct me if I'm wrong. If they reached out to us and referenced the webinar, we could connect them through to you for a little bit more counsel on that, right? Absolutely, I'd be happy to speak with them. Yeah. Um, does the last so last question I have in right now, and then we'll we'll look to wrap it up here. If you have any other questions, send them in real quick, and we can answer. But this is the last one on the on the big board here. Um, does the Circle program include any travel costs for either the GC um, or the intended parent? Um, Anthony, why don't you go ahead and weigh in on that one? Yeah, the 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 Circle program is very comprehensive for the gestational carrier, not only and for your egg donor, not only for um, travel for them and accommodations for them, but also for uh, uh, a partner that they can travel with. And all of those costs are covered within um, the, the cost that Sam had mentioned. Your travel costs getting to, uh, uh, to visit your surrogate, say during the pregnancy or to be there for the birth, those costs are not covered under our program. So, uh, and, and, and I don't know of any program that actually covers intended parents costs. But uh, as far as the surrogate is concerned and your egg donor is concerned, uh, not only is travel covered, but all accommodations are covered for both the egg donor and surrogate and for a companion. Great, thank you. Um, so we actually have two more questions coming up. They're both actually quite good, so I think it's probably worth worth taking them here. Um, so you know, if uh, Dr. Bauer, you mentioned this, if you stagger the journeys um, instead of doing a twin journey, um, would you be able to freeze the remaining sperm? Um, for a second journey later. I think I can answer that. We'd actually freeze the embryos themselves. We'd always create all the embryos up front um, with your donor, and then we'd freeze those embryos, um, and they're viable for years and years and years and years and years. I was talking to a doctor um, last week who had just had a baby born from embryos frozen 19 years ago, um, which is incredible. So um, yeah, so if you want to stagger your journeys, we do that egg donor journey up front, um, fertilize half the embryos with you, uh, half the uh, sorry for last half the eggs with you half the eggs with your your partner um, and then we have all those embryos available down the road so is that what you see most common dr bar yes yeah i agree with that um next question uh dr bar this one's perfect for you we have a potential egg donor but the egg donor is a little bit older uh, 39 um can you just talk briefly about kind of risks associated with known donors who are maybe a little bit older sure. so you know when we look at you know, the ovaries, right? We worry about two things, egg quantity and egg quality. And so the first step is to just kind of evaluate those things. So egg quantity, we call that ovarian reserve, how many eggs you have left. You lose your eggs over a lifetime. And we, we check a level called AMH, anti-malarian hormone, which is a hormone that's made by the small resting eggs in the ovaries. So the more eggs you have, the more AMH you make. That number is quantitative only. It is predictive of if I'm going to give you or your donor medications for IVF, how many eggs am I going to grow? How many eggs am I going to retrieve? So that becomes a very important quantitative marker, which I definitely would have checked on this donor. The other part of the equation is egg quantity. I'm sorry, egg quality. So egg quality is the genetics of the eggs, which is directly linked to age. So as we get older, not only do we lose eggs, but the eggs retain age. They get more and more DNA mutations, which leads to an egg with the wrong number of chromosomes, which either won't fertilize, will fertilize and not implant, or will fertilize and plant and lead to, lead to a miscarriage. And while there's no blood test we can do to test that donor for the quality of her eggs, we know from testing 
hundreds of thousands of embryos of different age groups that, you know, at 30, around half your eggs and embryos are chromosomally abnormal. By 40, it's about 90%. So at 39, you're looking at about probably somewhere around 85%. So it really depends on what her AMH is. If she has a really good ovarian reserve and you're gonna create a lot of embryos and be able to choose a good one, you're more likely to get a good one. But if she's 39 and has a very low reserve, it becomes a little bit of an inefficient process. So it depends, it depends on what her numbers look like, really. Not ideal for a donor at 39, but sometimes it works if you have a good reserve. Sounds good. I think we got them all. Uh, I think we got them all taken care of, guys. Everyone, thank you so much for for joining. Um, I, I really appreciate the time. And we've got a little bit of information there about reaching out to us. Um, further, I'll leave that up on the screen for just a second, and then you'll get a recording of this um, in the next day or so, um, in case you have any follow-up questions. So, um, thank you guys so much for um, everything. And uh, Dr. Bauer, any last words, or Tony, any last words? Just want to thank everybody for joining. Um, we're super excited for 2021 uh, in New York, and and hope to make a lot of you know happy families. And if uh, if we didn't cover any questions or if any questions arise, please take down the information here. Uh, both Circle and Shady Grove have um, wonderful consultation processes where you will learn so much more than you can get in just a short uh, webinar. So please, if you're interested, uh, give us a call. And uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Yep, and just one note, the email address down there, the first letter is an L, not an I. So it's lenterkin at circlesurrogacy.com. Thanks, you guys. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.